God was with me every step of the way. He never once left me. When our daughter Abby was a little girl, she used to ask me during the tough times, Daddy, do you think God is testing us? My answer really hasn't changed much since then. Baby girl, I think he's proving us. Prayer warriors, your never ending hope and faithfulness are in high demand during this challenging time. Stay strong. Warfighter Nation strong. Over the last couple of years, many ministries across the world have been rocked to their core due to service closures, pastors being arrested for keeping their churches open, and all who are capable have gone to online services exclusively in some cases. Some, like us here at Warfighter Ranch, have very small, extremely small platforms or groups and are relying solely on social media like Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for sermons and other content to educate and help heal our beloved warfighter nation, helping to heal their invisible wounds of the heart, mind, and soul through Christ. This is simply one of the tenets of the church, sharing the gospel, and thankfully we can do that from even here. These last couple of years, though extremely challenging, without a doubt have been an amazing opportunity for some to serve while others have used this time as a period of reflection. And for some of us, maybe a little of both. And this is a time when our family has had to be particularly strong. You see, after living with us for the last decade, my wife's mother, Bert, passed away here in our home during the onset of COVID during the initial lockdown. Warfighter Ranch had taken a short hiatus and turned our home office into a hospice suite 
to accommodate her wishes to pass away at home with family. This was particularly tough on my wife, Helen. Through some very long days with very little sleep, all I could really do was stand by her side. She kept thanking me, but I really felt like I hadn't done anything really worthy of note. But that is what Jesus teaches us about the power of presence, because we really are better together. Simultaneously, two of our sons, Gary and Austin, are both on active duty serving in the United States Army at Fort Drum, New York with the 10th Mountain Division. Their division motto is climb to glory. Climb those mountains, boys, and God will surely see you to the top. And since we sat down at the writing table for this project, Austin has since come down orders for the 101st Airborne. Not only my alma mater, but the alma mater of our eldest son, Gary, as well. Our family, it seems, really does have a rendezvous with destiny. But during some of this reflective time, I've prayerfully considered the weight of this message on my heart. I know that this probably should have been a no-brainer, and I really felt like God was telling me if there was ever a time for a message of love, hope, and community from His church, it's right now. And God is proving every day that though many have been separated for one reason or another, you can almost hear it, a cry across the world for togetherness, for community. We are craving it like never before during these unprecedented times. God has allowed things to slow down for a time to an appropriate level for His liking and in the process revealed our heart's true desires over the last couple of years. It showed us what we can live with and what we can't live without. And the tangible signs among his church are being seen globally. The world's acts of extreme kindness and generosity are steadily pounding a rhythm of revival for the church. And we are grateful to bear witness at such a time as this. There is always a message in the mess. The things that have typically divided people have seemingly faded into the background in some cases. And what is truly important is being impressed in all of our hearts. We're praying for God to heal our land and once again place us in each other's company consistently all over the world with all of our churches open. Most folks know that we're always preaching that we're better together. And so here's my proverbial baptism by fire into the deepest refinement of my walk in faith and into the ministry community. Here's what really happened on my road to redemption. I'm Ron Breland, University of Mogadishu, class of 93, and this is my We Are Stronger story. If after three somewhat historic and brutal combat engagements to primarily desert regions, you had asked me if I ever would have voluntarily settled anywhere near a desert, I would have looked at you like you were insane. But in 2010, God called me to settle in the desert. Not another hostile foreign land, but a different kind of desert. I didn't know it at the time, but this is where I would come to not only be refined and tested, but proven. The only thing I'd proven up to that point is that I could be a professional angry person, stewing in regret, survivor's guilt, and a host of other issues. My own pride was killing me. Sound familiar? But that's not where my story begins. Or is it? After all of that, and a very public, humiliating meltdown, losing a foster child due to a broken system, including, yes, even racism, leading up to a heart attack, 
I was really starting to second guess the calling I felt to go into ministry. I was heartbroken and exhausted. I had served the Army for 15 years as a firefighter up to fire chief and a nuclear biological chemical squad leader. And I'd also become somewhat of a quick reaction force connoisseur of sorts. I was an adrenaline junkie. In 1993, I served in Mogadishu, Somalia during the Battle of the Black Sea. This was later made widely known by the movie Black Hawk Down in 1996. I was a young soldier, new husband, and father at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The division motto for the 101st Airborne is Rendezvous with Destiny. We had no idea at the time that we were shaping history as much as it was shaping our futures. It had been the worst and most bloody fighting since Vietnam, and that battle that battle would forever change the landscape of the nonlinear battlefield through the global military side picture forever. The lessons we learned there will serve to save generations of warfighters, I pray. They came at the highest of costs. In 1999, I served as the Task Force Falcon Fire Chief in Kosovo after the large-scale genocide that country suffered under the evil dictatorship of Slobodan Milosevic. Most fighting-age men had been killed during the earlier Balkan Wars. This was a country of old men and children. The genocide there will be felt for a very long time. God save those good people. As my Army career was changing from one career field to another, with months of training and family displacement in between, I finally arrived at Fort Riley, Kansas, home of the Big Red One. In 2003, I was immediately deployed with the 1st Infantry Division's 1st Brigade Combat Team, the Devil Brigade, to Ramadi, Iraq from September 2003 through September of 2004. God really knew what he was doing, putting me and my boys in the Devil Brigade, because we would soon find ourselves in hell. Old Babylon itself, the Euphrates River Valley. That was a long, sustained, trauma-filled year full of death. Either you knew somebody who was killed, you were the one doing the killing, or avoiding the bullet that you just knew was inevitably coming for you. And almost 10 years after I was medically retired from the Army, it was only then that I would begin to walk with the Lord. I was already on the path. But I just didn't realize it yet. I believed in God, but I didn't know Jesus. Forward March. Mustard seeds worth of faith is about all I had. But my amazing wife, Helen, and I'm incredibly gifted and talented daughter, Abigail, helped keep me focused on Christ as we began the shaky road of healing from all this together. Must be about five or six years ago now, somebody introduced me to a veteran who ran a faith-based nonprofit here in Arizona. His name is Beckett Aguirre. I love that name. Beckett is a Strack Desert Storm Marine veteran who loves his God, his family, and his country. Beckett stopped by the house one day, and again, God knew what he was doing because I got rope-a-doped into going to my first combat trauma healing group uh, because Beckett was on his way to the meeting. And Helen was right there, and she said, well, you're not doing anything tonight. Why don't you just go? And there I was, under the bus. <music> the 
this group, this is where I was introduced to one of the greatest spiritual tools that I've ever seen, even to this day. The Combat Trauma Healing Manual, written by Chris and Renella Adsit through their Bridges to Healing Ministry. And years later, Beckett sold me my home. I met a bunch of other veterans there, among them Scott Clark, who has become my spiritual mentor. An AH-64 Apache pilot who survived not one but two deadly crashes in the mountains of Afghanistan. We became fast friends and Scott soon took me under his wing. I continued with that group for two years before I felt comfortable in my faith to lead a group of my own. It's a small group to this day, but an impressive bunch to say the least. Vietnam, Desert Storm, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo are among the campaigns experienced by our small group of merry men. Once a week or so, we come together in typical veteran fashion, and soon soldiers and Marines are slinging both banter and coffee like only we can. It is our culture. It is but one of the many ways that we express love to one another. We pray, and using the Combat Trauma Healing Manual as our guide, we step boldly forward on our path towards healing through Christ in community. Okay, on the manual. I was in a dark place for 25 long years, since October 3rd, 1993. One day, while at a small group held in my garage, I was blessed with a miracle of my own. We had been prayerfully discussing the topic of forgiveness for a couple of weeks at that point. The older veterans in our group offered a lot of insight as their years of experience had taught them many lessons. Admittedly, I hesitantly moved forward with the subject. I had survivor's guilt, and self-forgiveness issues of my own that were sown so deeply within me that not even I knew their true depth. But God did. It was nearing the end of our group time together, about 10 minutes out, when God reached down into my soul and allowed me to find forgiveness for myself that I had never known. War is chaotic. And a lot of times things just happen because they just do. We're not in control, cannot always lead, shoot, or execute the optimal result every single time. I'm not in charge, but I know who is. This uh, epiphany of self-forgiveness hit me right in the heart like a lightning bolt. I was just sitting there in my garage with the guys in a plastic Adirondack chair I was relaxed as I could be, or so I thought. All of a sudden, I felt like I was melting, and my shoulders, still guarded from years of tension, fell back against the chair. My neck, even being broken, felt the conflagration of stress just come off me literally like the weight of the world off my shoulders. I began sobbing quietly at first. Gradually, the other guys, while engaged in typical end-of-meeting chit-chat, began to notice as well. When they asked me what was wrong, the only words that I could find were, it's not my fault. This refers to the belief that I had always held, that basically everything that happened after the first Black Hawk helicopter hit the deck in Mogadishu all those years ago was personally my fault. It was a monumental burden that I had been carrying and I was finally free of it. Those demons died that day. And somewhere along the line between my wife Helen never failing to assure me that God's grace is infinite and that there was definitely enough for me and these deeply revealing conversations with these amazing godly men, something clicked. I know it sounds ridiculous even to say it, even to this day, 
to think that one junior enlisted soldier would be responsible for all of that seems completely incredulous. But those demons are tenacious. And as they whispered in my ear in my own voice for 25 years, they made me believe that these thoughts were my own. Big shocker, Satan doesn't fight fair. And there are no limits to what he and his minions will do to try to destroy us from within. Spiritual warfare rages on, my friends. And if we don't understand that we're engaged in it, then it is ridiculously easy to become lost, falling prey to that wandering lion. At the risk of repeating myself, which I have been told I have done on occasion, I have a simple strategy that I often use to illustrate the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, and that is this. One, the worst type of battle to be in is the one you don't know you're in. And two, you cannot fight a supernatural enemy on your own. You will be crushed every time. You have to have a supernatural ally to give yourself not only a chance, but a force multiplier and a clear battlefield advantage. That's what we do. Through the Combat Trauma Healing Group Information Network here in Arizona, Crew Military announced that they would be holding a private showing of a movie for all the Combat Trauma Healing Group members and their spouses. So, of course, we were immediately interested. But I wasn't quite as prepared as I thought I was to watch this movie. Everyone finally gathered at full retirement speed, I might add, and we found our way to our seats. Before I go any further, I have to mention that over the 50 or so veterans in the room, it was a most epic crowd. These men had participated in conflicts around the world, strung through history, and had seen, heard, and done things that no man should have to do. I was truly blessed to be in the company of heroes. There were paratroopers, rangers, attack helicopter pilots, marines, infantrymen, combat medics, corpsmen, special operations, and even some younger troops with way more tours than their mothers ever wanted for them, I'm sure. From the opening, it took me personally right back to rolling through the streets of Ramadi and Fallujah in late 2003 and through the Arab Spring of 2004. We were an army unit. However, our area of responsibility in the Al Anbar province was transferred from the 82nd Airborne Division to the 1st Marine Division. We had never worked for Marines before, in particular, a gentleman by the name of Mad Dog Mattis. I was an Army squad leader, serving as a truck commander in an armored Humvee with a gun crew. My seat in the gun truck was the exact same one as Vic's in the movie. We ran over 300 missions outside the wire during our year-long tour there. I could not have been more blessed to be with the men and women that I served with. And I thank God for them every single day. I can still see those well-traveled roads in my mind and occasionally in my nightmares, but not nearly as much as I used to. I looked around the room throughout the movie. I saw veterans of all ages, campaigns, and branches and spouses, all in a steady river of tears. The underlying soft sobs throughout the room revealed what my silent shaking had alerted my wife to, my own suppressed tears in a crowded room. To say that we are stronger was moving, riveting, exposing, or any other inflated or colorful adjective is simply an inadequate statement. I was Vic. Vic was me. Vic was all of us. He is all of us. And with that, I have to tip my hat and offer a sincere thank you to Ulysses Laramendi for your outstanding performance and heart's work for God's kingdom. 
I know he is surely smiling on you and yours. Everything from the dynamics in the marriage relationship to the friendships with other veterans and mental health professionals, and especially the welcoming nature of the faith community, was captured beautifully, perfectly, and universally in this film. I believe with my whole heart that We Are Stronger showed the fullness and embodiment of the church as an example of our best potential as children of God. In the movie, we were introduced to an organization called Mighty Oaks. Because of We Are Stronger, I drank in every piece of information I could find about the organization, watched every video I could, made phone calls, and a week later, God opened a door for me to attend a Mighty Oaks program at the Sky Rose Ranch in California. It was a revelation as I was able to voice my newfound forgiveness in my own rough draft of a testimony among those amazing men of God. I was once again in the company of heroes. We forged unbreakable bonds that have served God and each other well, especially networking with one another throughout the various ministries to which many of us have now been called. And no, I never saw that coming. But I probably should have, because the year before, my wife Helen had founded a, a veteran nonprofit ministry called Warfighter Ranch. I was standing by her every step of the way, but admittedly not 100% in my effort. I had given her all the usual lip service, but in truth it was still a half-hearted effort as I had not completely made it out of the dark yet. Only six months prior to Mighty Oaks, our family, we lost our foster daughter of three and a half years to a corrupt, racist, and broken foster system in desperate need of repair and prayer. She is our great niece, and although we raised her like our own, I realize now that God's vision is greater than mine, and I can only pray to see her again one day. I know God is watching over her. This hit our family extremely hard, as it seemed like it was almost like a legal kidnapping, so to speak. My heart was broken, and shortly after, I suffered a heart attack. Thankfully, God spared me yet again. That was 2017, and now it's 2022, and we have a thriving, unique military outreach ministry with future plans to acquire or build a ranch where, you ask? Texas, where we've been led to host our 30-day program, Camouflage, Healing Warriors' Hidden Wounds of the Heart, Mind, and Soul Through Christ. Until then, we'll continue to host our own and work to plant new combat trauma healing groups, continue our outreach through public speaking, offering my testimony, conducting our search and recognition missions, and encouraging the over 20 million members of the Warfighter Nation and winning souls for Christ. Fighter Ranch is now a humble member of the Stronger Alliance, and all of you? Well, now you're part of the fabric of our family right here at Warfighter Ranch. And my testimony? It's called How God Turned a Rendezvous with Destiny into My Rendezvous with Eternity. At the end of the day, we are stronger together. What's mission 13? Allow me to paraphrase. 13 years. Jesus and the disciples equals 13. The filthy 13 from the greatest generation and now the Kabul 13. Okay, God, I'm picking up at your land down. 
will create 13 13 piece collections. So that's 13 collections with each containing 13 individual pieces. Each collection will then be donated to a ministry or warfighter nonprofit to assist them in their fundraising efforts. Times are hard for many right now. Many hands make light work. And there's a lot of great work that needs to be done out there. So what's the catch, Ron? Well, as usual, there is none. Each nonprofit must be nominated. That's it. At the completion of each collection, we will release a video detailing the collection as well as the Ministry or Veteran Nonprofit recipient, and we'll go until it's done. Next mission, time now. Donations are always welcome. However, this project requires no funding from participants or nominees. It is a gift from Warfighter Ranch. Anyone, Anyone can time dots. What we do here is the art of spiritual warfare. Next mission, time now. Smoke Vet 6, this is Smoke Jumper 7. Roger that. Next mission, time now. The first two pieces are called simply 22. That's to represent the symbolic number of 22 veteran suicides a day. I say symbolic because only half the states in the country are mandated to report. It doesn't count warfighters, spouses, children, or any of the other residual fallout from this tragedy that has befallen our people. So these first two pieces, the one in earth tones is tied in a trinity helix braid, three strands representing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The patriotic version tied with red, white, and blue camo. She's dirty, but she's not gone yet. And a stripe of flames going through it to represent the suicide epidemic ripping through our country. These four strands are tied in our armor of God braid honored to give them to you today. These three pieces from our Thin Line collection represent the thin blue line and the thin red line. For our law enforcement and firefighter community friends, we love them dearly. I'm a retired fire chief myself. My brother's a cop. And it's just been in our family since the beginning of the country. And we could not be more honored to tie these three pieces in our infinity braid. You might call it a fishtail braid. Some of the ladies might recognize that from a hairstyle. But if you turn it on its side, the way it's tied, it represents the infinity symbol. And that represents God's infinite love for us. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not did not comprehend it.
Well, you know as well as we do that before the show is released, we can only glean whatever bits of information we can from the previews and such. And as I have done my detective work, I have detected a law enforcement presence. So we tied this one in our thin blue line style of a charm, but on airborne static line. The tensile strength is about 4,000 pounds. The Cobra buckle is unbreakable. And that represents the strength that we derive from our faith in Christ. This series is part of our Jesus is my jump master series. And for more on that, check out the link below. These two pieces collectively are called Out of Darkness. There's one in a short dog tag charm with the Breaking Strongholds image on there as well as one of our long tabber charms. Actually one of my very last. I've gone through thousands of these and these are probably one of our last four or five. But I knew it just looked so amazing on this and these two pieces are to represent when we can and do come out of that darkness. Pieces 9 through 12, these are called Breaking Strongholds. Tied in our Infinity Braid, representing the infinite love of Christ, each one, as with all of our pieces, now totaling well over 20,000 over the last 13 years, each one is a one of a kind. These feature the image of the tower as well as 1 John 1, 5. Light shines Light shine, in the darkness, shine, darkness, 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 and the darkness, and the darkness, 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 darkness did not, did not did comprehend not, it. Not, it. Not, it. Not, it.
may ask, how is every piece a sermon, Ron? Well, let me show you. This Breaking Strongholds piece is tied in the armor of God braid in this example here. And it falls true with any of our braids, the Infinity Braid, the Trinity Helix Braid, or this, the Armor of God Braid. This is four strands of paracord, gutted, but tied in such a way, it's almost like a divine phalanx, and it's super strong. So if you know, and these four strands represent the four books of the Gospel, so if you know where you get your strength from, you maintain that, keep your eye on the prize, which is his word, his promises, and then you stay strong till the end. However, if we don't maintain that connection, the bracelet falls away and doesn't serve its purpose. The same thing tends to happen with us. So these serve as a unique reminder and just a gift of love. That's it. Anyone, Anyone can time dots. What we do here is the art of spiritual warfare. Next mission, time now. Smoke vent six. This is Smoke Jumper seven. Roger that. Next mission, time now. I did have a suicide attempt. And to be brutally honest, the reason I didn't do it, and I was ready, I had abandoned all hope. My wife was on the other side of a door, my daughter on the other side of another door, and me locked in in between. There was nowhere to go. I had my thumb on the trigger. I had the barrel of the 357 tickling the back of my throat. And the reason I didn't do it is because I realized in that moment that I was about to meet my maker in about three seconds. And I would have to justify that as intelligent as he made me, with all the gifts he's given me, all the blessings he's given me, the incredible infrastructure and support systems, my wonderful wife, my five children, 20 million brothers and sisters with all of that how this could be the best course of action and then I realized not only that I was going to have to sell it like everything depended on it because it did and not even I could lie to myself with my own pride at that level something had to die that day me or my pride and I shot it dead where it stood faith and spiritual resiliency are the only combination that's been proven to effectively combat both the literal and spiritual bleeding in the warfighter community our veteran family is deeply hurting via the epidemic suicide and divorce rates so now is when we need to reach out in community with one another because we will always be better together.